talking today about the ABCs of SharePoint, which is great. It's going to be a ton of information from a totally different perspective that you guys probably haven't even thought about. Um, it's going to be tons of information that you use, so make sure you're taking notes because you're not going to remember all this. It's just a lot of information. Um, and also is a webinar. Um, so I sent that webinar out for today, and I'm going to actually set up a permanent webinar for this user group, and I'll send that out going for So we've got bad weather, or if you guys are like, my boss made me stay for this meeting, and now I can't get there in time, whatever. So I'll try to send that out every uh, month so you guys can attend remotely as well. Uh, anything else I missed? Nope. I think we're good. All right. Well, it's all yours. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, one thing we'll deal with through the presentation is that taskbar. The webinar program is making me keep it open, so <laughs> bear with me. Or just pretend it's part of the design. That's what it was. It was intentional. Uh, but my name is Nate Chamberlain. I'm from Lawrence. I work at LMH Health. I'm a SharePoint systems engineer there, although as with many SharePoint professionals, I never really feel like that title fits what I do. Because I'm also a consultant. I'm a business analyst. I'm an engineer. It's just a whole bunch of things in one. That's really what everything calls for. Uh, but recently, I wrote a blog post called The ABCs of SharePoint, featuring 26 different ways SharePoint can enhance your digital workplace. Uh, that evolved into a book, and now it's a presentation. So I'm glad to have all of you here to hear it. It's a little bit of a challenge, because fitting 26 letters into one hour is <laughs> going to do a little bit of math. It's just two minutes per letter. Uh, so some of those I'm going to skip, not skip. I'm going to breeze through them. And the other ones I'm going to elaborate on a little bit more. But if you have any questions, feel free to you know, stop me in the middle. Uh, when pizza comes, feel free to keep it casual. Just get up and get some pizza while it's warm. Um, and we'll just go ahead and get started. Any questions before we do? Sweet. Oh, you can see the webinar thing, too. There we go. OK. So I didn't bring my green hat. But uh, some of my coworkers got me this bright green hat because one of our colors in rebranding it all is chartreuse. <laughs> so they found a chartreuse, put SharePoint 8 on it, and that's what I've been known as ever since there. Um, and that's just the book. You can buy it at bitly SBC. I also brought some copies for sale, but someone here will win a free copy before they leave. So uh, also some all spun bags. So I lead the Lauren SharePoint user group. I have four bags, I think, that will be given away for free. Uh, my background is started at KU with Jason and Yang here. They're part of the Lawrence SharePoint user group, so glad to see them here too. Uh, but I started there with an internet that was all HTML. We moved to an internet that was all 365. So that was a big leap going from zero SharePoint to 100% SharePoint. I took a lot of user training, learned a lot from that, and carried that into my new position, working at Lawrence Memorial Hospital, now LMH Health. Uh, we started with SharePoint 2013, now we're on 2016. We used focal point solutions to make it beautiful, so I can't take credit for that design. Uh, but they did a great job, and we really love our new internet. So you're going to see some screenshots from all of these today. I just wanted to have a little bit of background of where they come from. All right, so the 26 letters. We're going to talk about them all, so I'm not going to read this to you, and you don't need to read it either. All right, so automation. A is for automation. Microsoft Flow, SharePoint Designer, you've probably heard of them. Uh, SharePoint Designer isn't something we're going to see in our future, but for now, we still have it. Uh, I love it. I know some people don't. Um, it may not be the most reliable thing to, to build workflows for, but I still find cases in SharePoint Designer that I cannot replicate using Microsoft Flow or other things. So for the meantime, I love it. We keep using it. Uh, calculating columns, if you're not using them, I'd recommend thinking every time you create a column or create a form that you think about, is this something that I cannot calculate? Uh, because if you're having your users spend more time entering data and doing their own calculations or figuring out how many years of service they've had, work for them. But, uh, just... uh, buttons and iconography. So if you wouldn't mind uh, entertaining me with the computer and going to mint.com, I have a little poll about iconography. And the code up there is 489933. Uh, let's see here. It's 48.99.33. So it's back up there now. All right. So basically, all this is is a three-question poll, just starting the conversation around buttons and iconography. 
The first one is, uh, what might these icons do if they were clicked or pressed? So I think you can enter up to three different options for each. So just with no context, you saw that icon, what might it represent or link to? Okay, so as we enter those, they show up on the screen. So so far we've got like, favorite, love, all star, <laughs> uh, agree. And you're right. This, these are icons that are represented to us through Twitter, Facebook, through all social media platforms. And we see them in SharePoint too. So when you see a star, you know you're going to be doing some kind of positive action uh, of some sort. So that's a pretty vague answer, but we all kind of have that shared understanding. So since it's already built into society and it's built into our brains and our kids are growing up with these kind of icons, why don't we build those into our internets too? All right, um, so the next one was a pencil. So draw, edit, write, document, revise. So we know again, that's some kind of action that we're probably gonna be doing. We're not just simply responding, now we're actually gonna be contributing some kind of comment probably. But again, just from an icon, we're sending that message. And then that last one looked like <laughs> kill a tree. I like that. Uh, just a printer icon, basically. But yeah, what would that do if you saw it? It'd probably either render a printable PDF of something, or it would actually start the printing process. Uh, but again, things that we're used to that we don't need a label for. Okay, so we went over some of these, but you also have retweet, you have pencil. Here, I'm going to come over here so I can see it over here. Let me see. <laughs> a printer, the phone icon, so if you need to make a call, and the home. All of these should be somewhat familiar, things that you could implement in your own environments. Uh, the pros, of course, with uh, imagery, you don't have to put text, so you don't have to worry about languages. Um, when we use iconography, we're able to reach anybody, no matter what uh, skill level they have with reading or what language they speak. Um, and we can put um, some kind of tools in there so that when people are using screen readers, it can still be read. Uh, we want to be uh, making sure that our content's accessible. Uh, cons, it could be interpreted differently. So even though we all kind of had a similar idea, print, kill a tree, all that, um, it might mean you know different things to different people. So on one site, for example, if you see a heart, Twitter, you go to another site, like a dating site, what does that mean? Like you want to know the context before you start hitting buttons. Uh, so that's one con, just being a little vague, maybe. Let's see. Oh, yeah, another con. So I use MailChimp. MailChimp gets blocked by our spam filters. So the more iconography and buttons and graphic elements you introduce, the higher your chances are of being marked as spam. So you want to be careful and learn about what kind of spam filters um, are in place before you start sending you know, things that you make out of Outlook. All right, so more icons. So these are a little bit more vague, um, not so clear. It's not a heart, it's not a star. Uh, but just continuing on the line, if we saw these on our intranet now, if we put it in that context, what kind of things might you see um, if you clicked on the very center one, the orange one? Mm -hmm. And how about the bottom left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all pretty straightforward. We can get an idea, or at least guess, that if we saw a police hat, Maybe it's going to take us to campus security or something. <coughs> Just another few more ideas here. We have an option, thinking again, iconography of listing out links sometimes. So would you prefer to click on the word Facebook? Or would you rather have an icon that's recognizable, something that everybody's familiar with? Uh, just some icons. So um, I use Stacy Dear Strolls solutions, they promote links. Uh, when I was at KU, so the bottom left one there, uh, that's really easy to do. You just need some icons, make them yourself, download them. There's um, is it awesome fonts or font awesome. Anybody use that? Some font language out there. It's free. If I think it's font awesome, uh, but it lets you do icons like that, and you don't have to have any graphic experience and no license, which is nice. All right, so adding promoted links in Officer 65. It's a lot nicer now. Um, if you're on-prem, you still have to go through a few hoops depending on which kind of method you want to go and if you want rows and different formatting. 
But in O365, it's as simple as just adding a web power for quick links, and then the icons are actually built in. So you don't even need Font Awesome. If you have Office 365, you can just use the Office Fabric icons. So I love that feature. Uh, content types, basically different versions of the same thing. So for example, in a list, you might have PTO requests, but you might also have vacation requests. They share a lot of similar fields. So that's when we start thinking about content types, when it's going to share an employee, it might share start date, end date, um, hourly rate, those kind of things. But they're going to have different fields too. Like, is this for you know an illness for yourself, illness for your family? Um, you're not going to ask that if someone's asking for vacation. So that's when we start thinking about content types. When things are similar but not quite the same. Uh, you can do content types for folders, documents. Uh, with documents, you can do templates. So I like that content types. I'm doing that right now for someone. Uh, where we're setting up a new document library and we're having one-on-one -on -one agendas, group agendas, just all these different content types on a library with shared metadata. So that also helps with workflows too. In SharePoint Designer, you can trigger a workflow only for specific content types. So you don't have to do, and if this has a certain um, field filled out, you can just start with, if it's the PTO content, Uh, an example here, so PTO, start date, end date, type, and reason. That's for FMLA. In that same library, we're collecting sick requests. So we don't need start and end dates, or what was it? We don't need the reason, there we go. We just need hours, how many hours of sick time. Uh, but when they're in the list view, then you have all of them together, and you can sort, filter, create your views. So multiple content types, one library, easy access, easier workflows. You don't have to build six, build one. Sometimes <laughs> so I've seen some workflows and I've built some workflows. Jason's seen some of them that are super long. So <laughs> it's better practice to make digestible workflows and to have ones that are super long that'll fail. That if you migrate or if you move it or copy it or need to stop it, have to be restarted at the very top. So anything with a timer job, especially, if you can break that out and make it so that if you do have to restart it in the middle, that's a little more possible I you do that. OK, uh, to get to content types, I'm not going to go into a demo, of course, but uh, it's just an advanced settings for both lists and document libraries. You need to first turn on allow management of content types. OK, and then in SharePoint Designer, this is the screen you see. If you want to set it for a specific content type, uh, you have the option down at the bottom to select a content type to use. Or actually, this is for creating a new form, sorry. So if you're going to customize your new form or your edit form, this is where you can say, uh, I want to do this for the PTO request. And you're going to add a custom HTML uh, or something to make that happen. And then in your document libraries, if you click on that allow management of content types, you'll see your specific content types on the new button. If you create the content types and then turn it off, which sometimes I do for different purposes, it'll go back to Word document PowerPoint, and you won't see the content types on the new button. Some options for you. OK, and reusable, so those are always nice. When you do a reusable workflow, you get to pick the content that it applies to. OK, I don't spend too much time here. OK, so here's uh, an example of an actual in workflow uh, example. So if it's a certain content type, go to travel requests, I'll just go to sick leave requests. Is everybody somewhat familiar with SharePoint Designer and how those are built? Anybody have any questions about it? OK. All righty, so content types information management policies. So if you're concerned about data loss prevention, content types can help you with that too. Uh, you can also tag content types, which is nice. So if you have a content type that is PTO, for some reason is asking for social security number, you could automatically tag that and have it locked for editing. You could lock it to the just to admins until it's reviewed. Uh, you have a lot of options once you start using content types. So information management policy settings and advanced settings, or um, in list your document library settings, is where you can get started with that. You go in there. Um, yeah, so if you clicked on that link, you'd have content types and then libraries and folders as your options. Uh, if you set a retention policy on a content type, uh, I think that trumps, it should say in there. Let's see. No, OK, so libraries and folders, and it tells you in there, uh, will trump any content type policy that you set. So let's say you have a document inside of a folder. 
You set a retention policy on that folder. Anything you set for the content type doesn't matter. It's going to apply that folder first. So, all right. Document sets. Uh, one example of a document set that we use at Element Health is we have system profiles. So we have server names. We have, oh, I don't know. We have routes, some kind of networks. I'm not an engineer like at heart. So <laughs> when I look at all their stuff, I'm like, oh, that's what this is. The addresses, the whole nine years, like they have all these different lists that squished together in a document set. And the way that works is they have um, one sheet that has basic information on every server and every document set. And they're adding different templates every single time they create a server profile. They just create the document set. It rolls in all the templates. So one example I put up there is if you do a project proposal, the document set's really great for projects because you say document set, aka new project, and it preloads it with your budget, preloads it with your policies, stakeholders and contacts, the proposal. It's got all that already in there. And so if you're not the end user, I would talk to your end users about that because chances are they're just copying and pasting a folder. <laughs> and this might be a better option for you, especially since you control that template in one place. All right. Uh, yeah, so we include documents, but sometimes it's just empty folders. Kind of had to do a workaround on that to get it to work that way, but I can just create a document set that has empty folders where people then know what to put in there if you don't want to put default documents. All right, so embeds, you can embed all kinds of things. So it depends, of course, on your environment and your administrative settings, but if you're O365, you have a few different options on what you'd have on prem. And by a few, I guess I should say, you have a lot more options if you're on Office 365 <laughs> than you do if you're on-prem. And you see them new all the time. Some I don't quite understand, like Amazon Kindle. But some I do, like just plain old code. That's what I like. Uh, plain old code, you can embed other SharePoint items, SharePoint document libraries. Uh, you can embed full websites if they support being presented in an iframe. You've got Power Apps, yeah, these are 365. Um, you can embed uh, Power BI Report Server in on-prem instances. So you're doing that right now at LMH Health. Uh, and you can use Power Apps on-prem if you have a data gateway. So there are some workarounds. You just can't, you know, kind of have to tweak and figure it out. Uh, and then YouTube, you can embed in either environment. Uh -huh. Pretty much. So for Office 365 and the modern experience, that's using SharePoint framework. Um, and personally, I JavaScript in the modern had a better experience. Yeah, I think they've pretty much restricted a lot of that, which kind of development in JavaScript and migrate and <laughs> in an app, yeah, like a solution or something. Yep. Right, it's not as easy for the end user anymore. All right, uh, so forms out of the box. So this is an Office 365 form out of the box. You create a list, you create a item, it looks like this. On-prem looks a little bit different, but the concept's the same. You have a list, create an item, it has a default form. This can be edited. Not, not, not a lot of people understand that or how they could change the order of form fields and all of that. But basically, you can customize your forms with Power Apps if you're O365. It's the best thing ever, I think, just because you can do a lot of visual elements. You can do some uh, conditional formatting that goes above and beyond that you could ever do with SharePoint. Uh, it just takes time. <laughs> time and learning. A lot of Googling is my experience with Power Apps. Uh, and then this is just a customized form I built on-prem. So this is using SharePoint Designer, creating a new form uh, for an item. And on the right-hand side, the client requirement was to do a floating attachment box. So hard and so I blogged about it. And if you want to do something similar, you can go out and get that. Uh, but basically, uh, for long forms like that, as they make selections, it's conditional form. It adds four more fields. And by the time they get to the bottom, they have to scroll either all the way up to the top or all the way back to the bottom to add attachment throughout the form. So this worked really well for them where they could answer a few questions, see that they have to add an attachment, add it there. Go a little bit further, answer a few questions, be told again, add another, add it right there. 
Uh, you can integrate Microsoft Forms. So uh, especially in Office 365, if you have a forms.office.com account, any form you build there can be embedded in Office 365. And not just the forms, but the results. So say you run a form, you're doing a quiz or a poll or a survey, uh, you finish it, and now you're ready to publish those results. You could a screenshot. That's fine. Or you can embed the actual results and let people interact with those. Governance. Um, I'm on the fence with governance at the moment, so back and forth at LMH Health about how we're going to do it. Um, I used to be of the mindset of a document, so I created a 14-page governance plan and threw it out there. It's still out there if you want it. Uh, but now I'm shifting towards more of like a governance resource center, so something a little more, a little more interactive, something a little less version history-ish. So again, this is going to come back to your specific environments and figuring out what works best for you. But at the end of the day, if you have a SharePoint upgrade that's going to change four of these pages and you have to go in here and edit it, you're just spending time doing busy work. Who's actually reading this government or governance policy and caring about these revisions that you make? Not a lot of people. What if the governance resource center where it has forms people can fill out? And say, I notice this issue. Is this something we can address? And maybe it's just more of a communication center, an ongoing conversation about usage of SharePoint, as opposed to a static document that people really don't want to have to go read. Uh, so if you do a plan or if you do a resource center, it doesn't have to be overly technical. It doesn't have to be huge. Please don't make it huge. Uh, so just accomplish your purpose. So before you even start, why are we even going to invest time in doing governance at all? Don't get me wrong. It's extremely important. It should probably be one of your first questions. Why are you doing it? Is it to protect data? Do you have certain requirements in place? Do you, are you legally bound uh, to create a document? Then by all means, create a document. Uh, and leave breathing room. So this is something that's really important. Uh, in my learning about SharePoint, I had a little bit of freedom, maybe too much. <laughs> and uh, I was allowed to break things. And so I did, and that's how I learned. Still today, I break things, and that's how I learned. And I'm really honest about it. You know, if something doesn't work, I let it pay the doesn't work, don't do it. <laughs> but that's my style of learning, and other people are different. Um, best case scenario, have a test environment, and if you have people um, who are able to access that and build there first, that's great. They can break that. If you don't, if you have end users who you are like that breathing to, just be cautious. <laughs> Maybe help them understand how they can uh, keep an eye on things so they can monitor their own uh, goods and such. Uh, I do a committee health, and so we did an activity with post notes. It's just card sorting, basically. And pizza's here, so once that's ready, you can scoot over there and get some of that. Um, yeah, so for card sorting, what we have three menus, one at the top, and they were all huge. Like, <laughs> the left one went all the way down. The footer one had five different columns, and they were extensive in length. And the top one was like a uh, kind of like a mega menu, but a mini mega menu. <laughs> It's just a ton of menu options from the home page, and then with the footer at the top, every single page. So uh, the governance committee took the time of taking all of those links, putting them on post-it notes, and creating one single menu. And that's something that your committee could do as well. Uh, so if you have navigation issues, just take it out of your hands and go to the end users, the people who are actually interacting with who understand where things should be and how they want to access those. And then I split my group into three groups with all the Post and each had a set, and I said, you know, organize them logically. So if this, this header doesn't make sense, if business processes means nothing to you, scratch it out, write something else, create a new post it note, make a menu that makes sense to your group, talk it through. And it's really important for those groups to have a diverse amount of people. You've got your administrators, you've got your nurses, end users, people who have different experiences and different needs, people from compliance who understand things that have to be present on the home page. Uh, just make sure you have you know, a broad representation when you're doing these kind of things. Hub sites. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of hub sites. All right, a few. Awesome. Uh, hub sites are really exciting, I think. It's an Office 365 concept. They recently just added the ability to manage these a little bit more easily in the O365 Admin Center. They used to have to use PowerShell if you wanted to make an association, so we're moving past that now. Uh, but hub sites basically are a bucket. So you can say I've got, there's a good GIF up there from the Microsoft website. Uh, but you can say you've got projects for this one project separate from the site that it's relevant to. So for 
for example, in IT, if you have a project for construction of a new building and putting all the different uh, hardware in place. Uh, maybe you decide at some point that that project needs to be moved to the IT site or some kind of hub with that instead of being in the project hub. Hub sites allows you to move that stuff easily without breaks. That's huge. Mm -hmm. No, you're good. Quietly in a piece, I'm sure that they would. Yeah, you don't hurt my feelings. <laughs> Please go get some pizza. Oh, no, you're good. All right. Uh, so, internet, you saw these screenshots a little bit earlier. This is where I started uh, going from KU with all HTML to um, Office 365 for the first time, learning a lot as I went. Um, but internets, I think, are the number one usage of SharePoint. Some people just need it for document storage. Why not just use OneDrive? Uh, so really maximizing on the possibilities of SharePoint when you look at what a tool can do, uh, that's really what kind of determines the, you know, the end usage of it. So uh, internets at LMH Health. Again, we started 2016 or 2013, ended up in 2016. Now we're looking at going to 2019. And I like to talk about internets because I think it's a challenge for everybody. Especially for those, of, well, you know, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say especially for those with Office 365, there's a whole different set of challenges. So no matter which environment, and if you're on-prem, you're dealing with migration, you're wondering about content, you're hosting it yourself. Uh, if you're going hybrid, you've got a whole other list of issues. If you're Office 365, you've got updates rolling out all the time, and ahead of those can be an issue too. Impact things you've already built, things that you might have paid for. Uh, so internets have a ton of challenges, but it's worth it, and you need someone dedicated to staying on top of changes. A JavaScript and JSON. So uh, this is an example from the Microsoft website of doing conditional formatting using JSON in Office 365. So it's pretty cool where you can say, you know, if this field says 90%, shade it in with 90%. <laughs> it's a nice thing, a nice visual, easy to do. You can copy and paste from their website. If you're on-prem, you can do JavaScript, so I'm a lot more comfortable in this realm. Uh, you can do CSS stuff. So for example, this is a floating called header. So you say, I want the header to be a different color. I want it to be bigger, smaller. I want to add an image. I want it to float with the list. Um, it's the number one request I get is when I'm scrolling a big list, I want a floating header. So implement it with a little bit of JavaScript. If you're Office 365, I don't think you have to worry about it because it floats automatically. So. All right, knowledge management. So this is one of my favorite books. I go to it all the time. I'll open it again and again. Uh, content strategy, where you really have to start thinking about who owns content, um, who's responsible for updating it. If you have some policy tech where you're going in regularly and things, that's part of your content strategy too. Um, but there's a whole bunch of considerations when you think about it. Uh, lists and libraries. So lists and data, um, libraries and documents. That's one of the questions I get. In addition to What's the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint? <laughs> That's my two big questions. So list, just think of it like Excel. Libraries, think of it like documents. OneDrive, think of mine. SharePoint, think of it as ours. So those are things I repeat and repeat. I put it in my email signature at one point. <laughs> uh, but also lists and libraries are the building blocks of SharePoint. So that's what it really all boils down At the end of the day, you're building up, which is going to feed a SharePoint list, which in the end is just List of data. All right, so document libraries. Uh, one feature I like to point out, I'm not sure if I have it in a slide later, so I'll mention it now. Uh, but in on prem or the classic experience, you have this little, I don't know if you can see it very well, but that edit icon with the pencil and pad, that's a built in feature of SharePoint. If you just go into your view, uh, it's called edit. You click it, move it to number one, and then users have easy access to edit the metadata of that item. Of course, you could do edit this list if you have that turned on for quick edit. If you don't, this is a nice quick option. Just have people do a one click and then the metadata for an item. If it's a list instead of a library, then it takes them, of course, to the edit form. So if that's just something for usability, I implement a lot. Mm -hmm. Additional databases. Uh -huh. Right, so with our systems, we have two different We'll have a list of just all of our IPs and then all of our computers. And by using lookup columns, that's how we build relational databases. 
we still have basic lists at the core of it, and now we're tying them together. And you can do that with one too, where you filter one web part of a page, and if you have others placed there, you can have them filter the others and do different things. Is that kind of what you're thinking? I've had a lot. Left underscore workflow field, and I hide it in the background because with lookups you can't do a lot of flow things. So, don't care. So, oh, and if you change a lookup item, especially in HR, if you change the department name, for example, but you can't change it on your old forms, too bad. Because <laughs> when you change a lookup item, it changes on whatever items are out there which is both a benefit and a bad thing about lookups. Uh, so what I did was I set up a workflow that said, when the form is submitted, capture all the lookup values, copy them into these plain text columns that we captured them at that point in time, and either just hide them for all of eternity so we know what the original was, or view and hide the look. A way to go around. <laughs> but if that accomplishes the purpose, I guess it works. All right, uh, so this is a modern list. I found out when I was doing a, a tweet report I like to do for events, the images in SharePoint Online, which is really nice. Um, you can do it in SharePoint Online too, just hyperlink as an image. And so when you're using Flow to get tweets, you bring them in, show the image, great. Take it one step further, which Office 365 is really good at letting you do. And you can create your own custom Twitter app. So use Power Apps, and you've got your own for tweets coming using Flow and Power Apps, and it's just for your event. That's pretty cool. Uh, do another thing with it, Power BI. So you've got all these images. Power BI supports images as you want. So you can do a uh, There's a organization you can get from the photos. Randomly put in there, and the most recent one gets smacked on top, and people can see what the actual tweet was related to it. It's kind of cool if you have Power BI or Power Apps and want to play with images in SharePoint. What do they do? OK, so metadata is just another one for columns or additional information. So uh, the biggest way I always tell people when I'm doing training uh, to use metadata is in your views. Choosing every time you insert metadata, you're giving yourself an option to filter later. So think down the road. When you create a list for the first time, how are you going to want to display or report on that data? Is department important to you? Is date important to you? What data should you be capturing, what manually or to make sure it's you're able to create these kind of views that you want. Uh, this view is based on location. It's not the greatest view uh, because it relies on what people entered in Twitter for their location. So uh, sometimes it's you know garbage. If you're familiar with the Lawrence acronym LFK, that's what some people put, and it shows up as Texas when you put it on a map. <laughs> so sometimes it depends on the quality of data you get, and if you're getting it directly from someone's Twitter profile, uh, so you do kind of rely on that when you do automation. Um, another book uh, I didn't mention, but I have an MLS. My background's in libraries, uh, so I like to throw in books every now and then. I like to write books. <laughs> uh, but Don't Make Me Think is another great book. Uh, content strategy was great for thinking about content management and who owns it. Don't Make Me Think is focused more on usability, accessibility, um, creating websites that you know welcome all or have all in consideration when you're putting in graphic elements or putting in flash elements or um, even uh, dialog boxes, how those might be restricting this to some people. Uh, and then also the importance from upper left to lower right. I mention that all the time, talking to new site owners about where they should play. <laughs> you open up their page about the IT department. But what do you do as a visitor to that site? You go to that page, you skip right over about our department to get to what you're looking for. People, maybe they are if they're new. Um, anyway, it's another topic. People aren't going on the internet to go to your page to learn about your department five times a day. Chances are when they come to your page for a resource, your forms, your uh, documents, your resources, your guides, uh, contact information, especially in IT, your help desk number should be at the top. But about the IT department being established in 1992, you don't need that. All right, Office 365 integration. Uh, depending on your plan, you've got a lot of options available to you. 
this doesn't cover them all. <laughs> but it's just a few of your uh, app listed Office 365. Uh, there's a lot out there. And personally, I really like Planner. We have Project at LMH Health, but Planner is a tool for individual community to-do list. Um, you can do a lot more with it, but at the core of it, that's what I see is just tasks for yourself. Uh, it's a lot like Trello. So if you have that familiarity with those cards, you can make buckets of tasks. Um, it works pretty well. Uh, let's see. Another one I haven't mentioned. Ah, Dell. So if you use Dell and have people insert, and we'll get into this in search a little bit, but if you have people entering their profile information, if you don't have Dell, think my sites. Uh, so if my sites, Dell, people enter their information in there, then you can search on that later and filter by things. So at Office 365 at KU, I could put in, I went to Emporia State University. At LMH Health, on my site, I could put in, I went to Emporia State University. So either experience, they're both searchable when you search for people. And so when you do a day on the job like we did at KU Libraries, and you want to know who's an alumni of Emporia, you just search Emporia, filter, or you get your filtered list, and then you contact those people to see if they could speak or show up or welcome people. Uh, so it's, it's a nice way just to build community if you use either features. Well, let's see, Power Apps, security and compliance is a big one. So if you're concerned about loss prevention, uh, make sure you're I can end that or sharing that with the people who should. Uh, teams, that's a huge more SharePoint user group. Next month is a Valentine's Day themed Teams meeting. So <laughs> make sure you come to that if you're in the area. I hear she's sending, or Melissa Hubbard's leading that one if you didn't hear that earlier, but I hear she's sending some kind of goodie for people. So look forward to that. All right, the permissions. Uh, this is a big piece in SharePoint. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of using SharePoint is that custom uh, permission group based permissions uh, so that for example when someone visits the IT page if IT department we can show them a different experience than what we show everybody else so instead of creating different pages and different sites we could just create one site and have a permissions trend so saves a little bit of maintenance but it doesn't always work so um, you might just think about your <laughs> right you might think about your group structures and such and really do testing you can also be aware that, especially in Office 365, it's easy to share a document. People who are sharing with internal users um, are aware that they're sharing with external users. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's just tempting to copy the hyperlink you see, send it to someone. And one nice thing about SharePoint is that if you copy the right hyperlink and you have to have existing permission, no harm done. You send it to your Aunt Bertha and she tries to open it and says she can't get to it. That's fine. The opposite, though, send an anonymous access link to someone who shouldn't get it, the wrong address, you forward it, you reply all. Something happens, that link gets to someone who shouldn't have it. That's a compliance issue. Uh, so I would recommend just going on a deep dive into your settings or talking with people who do and just seeing what do you allow your users to do 265 or on-prem. Can they create anonymous access links? That's something you can control. Um, and you do want to allow that, but you also want to allow uh, for education, <laughs> that's the biggest piece. Whenever you enable people to do something risky, you need a lot of concern about the education about that. They can't be held responsible for something they weren't provided an opportunity to learn about. Uh, so that's a, that's a tricky topic. We'll save that for another time. Let's see. Um, oh yeah, uh, you're running to cancel permission sometimes, I guess. Don't have to worry about squinting and taking pictures. Uh, but there's full control. I can even read the next one, design, I think. Uh, and then a couple more. There are some levels that have that. Uh, time if I run into a barrier, I will tell you how to fix that or get people the right access. Uh, queries and search. So this is another huge feature in search. So I cheated, and I did search and queries together. <laughs> uh, so queries, the difference would be is that you have content across all your sites, and a query is to go and crawl through all of it and bring back pieces that match your query. Um, a search is an end-user focused piece that allows people just to go to the search bar, type in whatever they want, uh, and get a result that they have access to. It's work the same way with access. So for example, in the, oh, let's see, 
Let's do the bottom left. That's a calendar. It's a live calendar as of this morning from LMH Health. Uh, what we did was just a roll up of events and it too. So everybody on the home page of LMH Health's website sees a different part of the SharePoint Governance Committee team site, and I'm part of LMH, the big one. And then I'm also part of IT. I see all three of those calendar events rolled up into one on my home page. And that's just by using a search query and some design. And then in the bottom right, that's another query. That menu button is live. I want to make it so I have the link all the time. So all the go in and drop their PDF for the current week's menu. And then that menu button is linked to the most current upload. It's that simple. It's always updated. And nobody has to worry about it. We don't have that anymore with our new design. So <laughs> it's one of those things to spend a lot of time on, and then it disappears. Uh, so then at the top behind my face, uh, recently we implemented this where we've got uh, results from LMH and results from Bing. You can introduce search engine results into your SharePoint results. And we did it in a separate way, but in a hospital when people search for MSDS, We've got internal MSDS uh, results, but maybe they were looking for the external MSDS results. Um, and we decided to do that as a result of our governance committee going through search reports and deciding on whether we should do it. It's a questionable thing. Do you want to make it more confusing, less confusing? We had a lot of conversation about it. And when people were looking for Westar, so maybe they're trying to pay a bill. We don't know. <laughs> but that was the number one result. Like, like one of the top results, and that's all we looked at, was like the top uh, 10 abandoned queries um, and different things that SharePoint gives you out of the box. Uh, What's that? <coughs> That's what it was, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, let's see, it's being elevation. Oh, yeah, and in the center there, so that's our people search. Is uh, a people directory solution that I think it was further customized a bit uh, for us. So basically, that people search allows you, like I was talking about with Delve and my sites, it allows you to crawl that content as well. So you can't really see it there, but the search in the background, the people search, the term was Power BI. So if you search people for Power BI, you're going to get people who listed that as a skill. Say, Nick's out of the office. He's the only one you know of that knows Power BI. People probably aren't going to be too excited to go and put everything they're good at because they don't want more work to do. But if you make it sound appealing or incentivize it in some way, maybe they would. It's definitely an optional thing. It's hard to they're good at something. Um, let's see. Something I didn't put up there is search synonyms. So if you're on-prem, you can import a thesaurus into your search. So if someone searches for material safety data sheets, also search for MSDS. If someone searches for DR, also search for doctor. And that search because some of our volunteers who work at the front desk uh, of the hospital near admissions uh, would be searching for DR Park, so Dr. Park. But it wasn't coming up with anything because DR meant nothing to SharePoint, but now it means Dr. Park. And Dr. Synonymous also with PhD or uh, MD. Or there's... Anyway, so now they get those results that they're looking for. And that's by using a search thesaurus. And 0365, you can't that we can get something similar using query rules. So has anybody had a thesaurus experience in 365? You're supposed to be able to do something with managed metadata, but I haven't had luck. Have you? Oh, like a search thesaurus experience in 0365? Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, speaking of queries, and uh, upper left there, that check mark next to that first result when I search for Power BI, that's a, um, I think it's called a query rule that I set up, and it shows a promoted result. So that's one of your options when you do query rules, is to say when someone searches this exact phrase or searches a keyword that appears in this managed metadata term set, show this result first, or show these results first. So for example, when someone searches for Weststar, I could, if I want, so say Weststar, the external website is the first result. It doesn't appear in our SharePoint search or our result sources in SharePoint, but I can make an external site our first result, like Power BI, which links to our report server. Okay, uh, Roadmap, if you're not familiar with that, that's a great way, especially for Office 365 people, to know what's coming next. Um, it's not. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I'm trying to choose my words here. Um, it may not always tell you what you want to know, and it may not always tell you 100% truth. So uh, I would just take it with a grain of salt and think of it as an idea of what could possibly happen. I'm going to get invested in anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it does give you an idea of what's been submitted, what people are talking about, what's important. Uh, so I would just take it from that perspective and say, you know, in quarter one, we hope to release that. To you, that should mean within the next 365 days, we might see something. Uh, SharePoint Saturdays and conferences. Uh, if you're not familiar with SharePoint Saturdays, you might have heard us mention it earlier. They're free events. They're uh, in different country all around the world, actually. Uh, and this Saturday is in St. Louis. It's the second closest one. Is Omaha our closest? About the same. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> aside from us. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have one in Kansas City, and we do it at um, And then there's one in Omaha at University of Nebraska, and then one in St. Louis now at the Microsoft Center. So if you're free any of those weekends, I think um, this weekend in St. Louis, October 13th is Kansas City, and Omaha is usually April or May. Uh, but anyway, for all that information, spsevents.org. And they usually do lunch and breakfast, and so even if you just put food and do it, then that works. <laughs> um, I do. I started collecting local user groups on my website, pointlibrarian.com. Just go to librarian.com slash events, but I'm also bringing in, uh, it's from all around the world, actually, user groups and conferences and any training opportunities, just to try to bring it to one place. There are other people doing something similar, I learned, um, so I'm going to try to look at those and make sure I'm not recreating wheels. Uh, but if you're interested, there is a pretty big listing right now of things that are going on, and you can filter by your area. Uh, if you want to pay the conference experience, something that's more I do recommend the Collab Summit, or Collaboration Summit. That's $150. You're not going to find a price uh, better than that for the kind of speakers you get. Uh, and I think Sharon was at SPSKC, the code. So SPSKC would get you another $50 off, so $100 to see the same speakers you see at Mess Ignite, SharePoint Fest, SharePoint TechCon. So they're really nice events. I've been to SharePoint Fest a few times, and I really enjoy that. But you do see the same topics and the same speakers you do in Branson. And it's a lot smaller, so it's a little more intimate. Uh, so you get more time with the speakers. You can talk with them afterward, more success, and you don't have to wait in a long line. Uh, it just feels like a more personal experience. But that's my opinion. You should always go to the SharePoint conference and get an Xbox. <laughs> so. It's up to you. Uh, tasks and timelines. So uh, Microsoft Project has a lot of task functionality built into it, if you have that. It uh, just basically takes what's out of the box of SharePoint and adds a few more layers to it, bringing in like resources and such. Uh, but out of the box, SharePoint, you've got tasks that can be in a hierarchy. So you might have a big task that has a bunch of subtasks. And uh, you've got to do a timeline. The unfortunate thing is you have to manually add to the timeline. I go to a site after they've requested a project site, and they have a timeline, it's blank because it takes work. It takes more time and administrative effort to go in and say, show this on the timeline. Um, I'm not too familiar with the Office 360 task experience yet, but at least on-prem, it's still very much. Here's a task list manually connected to the timeline every time you want. Uh, one nice thing about tasks is that you can also build workflows for them. Works like any other list in Sharp. So when I create a task, email the person it's assigned to. Uh, depending on the type of workflow you use, 2010 or 2013, you have different possibilities for how that looks and how it functions. Uh, be delete or delete a list. <laughs> so that's happening. We have ghost workflow messages that continue to come from test environments and dev environments. So be mindful also if you're developing a test environment that those workflows might actually be live. And so people get confused and they don't check the from address and it's a whole thing. So. Anyway. Moving on, uh, project tasks, that's just a glimpse of a timeline, and then in the background, that's a Gantt chart. So you don't need fancy software to get a Gantt chart, but you need fancy software if you want a better Gantt chart. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I didn't put it up there, uh, but I do have a screenshot of the Gantt chart. Uh, there is a visual you can get for that that looks OK. All right, uh, usage report. So I mentioned that my governance committee and did in, um, some analysis of the search of SharePoint, where they came from. Uh, as a site collection admin, I think you get this level of reporting. As a site 
admin, I think you get two reports maybe. But no matter what, you have uh, the capability to go in and find what people are searching for, what they're not finding, what they're abandoning, um, that kind of thing. And then you can bring that to a group and try to make using query rules, promoted results, uh, result blocks. So for example, we search policy tech, which is a separate application. We bring those results into SharePoint. You have to set up some kind of relationship with them, but then there's a block of just policy tech results. Uh, versioning. <clears throat> Another great feature that people don't always know about uh, because in their copyright folder, they're saying different names for these files instead of just having one because they don't understand that they could just turn on versioning and then there's minor versioning major versioning capabilities and then at any one point in time I can open up that version history and restore a version so let's say um, a committee gets together we're drafting something we don't like where it's gone and we want to go back a step we can just view the old version see how far we've come or where we started or we can restore that version and you don't have to worry about losing that current version if you do restore because just becomes another version. So it's nice and you can limit the number kept because sometimes those files are huge. And if you keep 100, that might be significant. <laughs> you can do unlimited too, I think, last I checked. Um, so I just be mindful that if you turn on versioning and you have people doing version on video libraries, a bit of a mess for you. And also I'll just mention, so you've got version in SharePoint, you also have version in OneDrive. The experiences are very similar, just a little bit different. Uh, web parts. So Office 365, you saw a little bit earlier when we added that quick links going on. Uh, you can get the icons and all that. It's a big kind of tool. Built some web parts all over the page, set different page layouts. If you're on-prem, you're probably familiar with this then. Uh, your web parts look a little bit more simple. You don't have cool things like Power Apps Embed easily and all that. Uh, but there are some really powerful things like the search query tools that I was talking about earlier. I think that's just called content. There's a search, uh, yeah, content query and search query web parts. I use those two a lot. Uh, this is Office 365, just a little bit of it. I think it's a lot bigger now. Does that look too small? Probably. <laughs> uh, but they're adding new stuff all the time. I think it's a lot more colorful now too. It used to be Amazon was the only colorful icon. And last time I checked, I'm pretty sure there was a little bit more representation there. Uh, XML and XML. So in writing the book, this is where I got to my troubling point. It's like X, Y, and Z. This is not going to go well. <laughs> like, why did I start this? <laughs> uh, but there are things. I was surprised myself to a little bit more about these because I don't deal a lot with X, Y, and Z so much. Um, and I'm sure none of us do. I mean, there's a ton of S's, a ton of C's, but when you really start trying to think about what could X, Y, and Z be, it's so I really scratch. Here we go. Uh, XML and XSL. So if you're on-prem, you're making any kind of modifications, like when you're making the new form different, for uh, you'd be editing a language called XML, XSL, one of those two. Uh, and if you're 365, you don't get X, you just get the SharePoint framework. And then yes, no functionality. Uh, so that's my why. Uh, if you have a form, you can do a checkbox as a column type. It makes it quick and simple. You can also do a drop down. And the difference is really, you know, is that you can, with a drop down, at least add another value. So if it's not as simple as yes, no, and maybe there's a maybe, you could probably do a drop down instead. But yes, no is really nice for quick and easy forms. We all like quick and easy. Mm -hmm. Ooh. If you need it to be a required field, then you need it to be a drop down. Uh, and because not check marked is the answer no. So you can't make it required because it's automatically populated. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's a really good point. And there's another thing. Um, so if you have default values for a checkbox, that's a little bit trickier to set up. I did write a post on that one if you need it yourself. But in our case, we had a bloodborne pathogen form, and at the time we had certain labs that we wanted checked by default. So if Goes to a bloodborne pathogen, uh, we would like you to get these labs or things that are pretty standard. So we check those boxes and then leave a few more that are optional for you if you like to get those checked out. Um, so you can do a multi select default value for checkboxes if you run into that. And then Z, zone templates. So my final stretch uh, if you're on premise, you're probably familiar with using zone templates to create your pages and such. 
Uh, so SharePoint designers, we got to go for that. All right, so deleted <laughs> scenes, just a really quick slide here. I'm not going to read it to you, and you don't have to read it either. Uh, but as I was going through this, I worked on an Excel sheet, and I had a B. So you can see C was a really tough one for me. <laughs> Ultimately, I went with content types. Uh, but there's so much, like calculating columns, which you might have noticed I squished into something information. And I tried to get as much as I could by cheating it into other letters, uh, if I couldn't get one of the Cs in there. And content strategy, uh, that book, some different things. Uh, conferences I put under S. Uh, but there's so much out there. And I hope you, uh, some of this that I talked about today gave you some ideas of things you could explore. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about upcoming events. So after today, uh, this group meets monthly. Uh, the next speaker is you. Yeah, so it's easy, but I won't get it. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. And then Lawrence SharePoint User Group webinar only tomorrow. Uh, the next meeting after that is that Valentine's Day one. SharePoint uh, Saturday in St. Louis. And then just search around. If you just search User Group uh, on Google and perhaps whatever you're in. And there's probably a group out there already, uh, something for you get, to get involved with. A meetup. Uh, so I do have copies of my book today available. Um, I can take cash or card if you're interested and want to leave with a copy. Uh, I'll also be giving away one in a drawing, and then four bags uh, for the Lawrence SharePoint user group. That's it. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. It's nice to see you all. No delivery drivers. Yeah, one person. <laughs> is there anybody that needs to opt out? Um, every once in a while, I get a government employee or somebody who has to opt out of the drawing. We can do a random number generator. There you go. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put, okay, so if nobody's opting out, all the numbers <laughs> should ever be safe.